Just before we uh, share something with you on video, the, I want to say that God has been raising up people in this church and the churches that have been in contact with this church for a number of years. The, uh, you have gone from uh, uh, the cow pasture or the horse pasture to uh, the pastures of the, of the world. And God has uh, been developing the quality of ministry here. Amen. Stepping into these ministries has always required great courage. And then it requires great commitment. The courage, courage comes by inspiration. It's seeing a need, seeing a desire, and seeing a possibility. Courage on the battlefield is usually brought about by a deep sense of responsibility, not only to what we believe in, that, uh, that we've, that's got us on the battlefield, but who is with us. What will happen if we don't do what we're supposed to do? If we don't take the, the, the vision forward? But every attack, whether it be in the Marine Corps on a beachhead or being dropped off in a rice paddy or a, the mountain jungles of, uh, North, uh, of the demilitarized zone, there was a mission that get, was given. But missions don't, go the way according to plan. Missions have to be dealt with once you get on the ground or you get on the beach. The Marine Corps have, have a term, and that is to, uh, to uh, uh, improvise and overcome. And uh, the, it is because the battlefield is always changing. The, uh, the need is always different. What we thought we were going to be doing uh, is going to be challenging. The, uh, one of the uh, great battles of Iwo Jima or uh, uh, Peleliu, which in particular in the Second World War, were battles that uh, we lost an enormous a lot of, amount of men, more so than what I'm going to show you here, even at Normandy. The, one of the greatest battles... Uh, in the South Pacific was the, the, the gathering together of Marines and Army people and going into Petalu and then also in Guadalcanal and also over into Iwo Jima. The, uh, the battles were tremendous and what they thought was going to take a few days, especially like on Iwo Jima, took much longer. And the, the amount of dead and wounded were staggering. Because nothing went according to plan. Because the bunkers, many of them were made out of not only concrete, but bamboo. <laughs> and bamboo has the ability to take a, an impact and then bounce back. The, uh, so let that speak to you prophetically here, that you can take an impact and bounce back. But we had to, they had to make decisions once they were on the ground. They had to improvise, and then they had to overcome. And that's what God has been speaking to this church here. Not only during this conference, but the, uh, the years that's been taking place of developing, because the best is yet to come. Because God has, implant, has a plan for His church. That the, we are not weak and frail and hiding. We're not waiting for the Calvary to come and get us out just before the enemy comes and sweeps over us and overruns us. We are infiltrating. We are taking ground. We are willing to take the, the chance. It's where courage, it's where courage takes, comes into being. It's where then from that courage we get the commitments. But courage is inspired. And what's it inspired by? It's inspired by valor. Valor is a value. It's deep rooted in you. And we saw on the video that started that uh, uh, about valor being an uncommon thing, but it was a common thing there.
By the way, that Iwo Jima Memorial, I used to put the flag up on that. And uh, the, uh, was uh, marched around it. Actually, I was down inside. You can go up on next to the feet, and there's a little hatch that you can pull up and go down the ladder way inside. And so I, I did that a while, too. <laughs> the, uh, but I respected that place because uh, one of the things that I used to have to do was go out and change the flag and put up the, the, uh, uh, the weather flag when we were going to have bad weather there while I was stationed at headquarters, the Marine Corps, and make sure that the, the, the big flag came down, put a smaller flag up during the storm. The, uh, but uh, courage is a, is a value. And courage comes because you believe in something, the virtues. And this church is a place where courage is encouraged. It's that it is encouraged to do and accomplish. Thank you for the conference, Pastor. Thank you. And, we, and I know that some of you may be thinking, well, we just focus on Pastor Nancy, but really uh, it's, she's the headship. And it all goes down, and when we're able to, because when we speak to her, we're speaking to all of you that are that make this possible. And but uh, without her willingness and obeying the Lord, and uh, being there with Bishop Miller, and when the Lord says, "Help her, help her, take the courage to do this." Step into the fray. Here's what the Lord says. I will make your walls salvation. And I will cause your gates to be pearls. And your walls shall be a flame that burns up the dross. Shows the quality of, of what the building is all about. And your gates shall be a place where pearl is one pearl, but pearls are brought about through pain and irritations and something that's come in. So everyone that comes through the gate is going to be coming through the pearl. It's going to be the testimony of past decisions, past events, past difficulties, past pains, but it's the pearl of beauty. And you come into the walls of salvation and he's making you that. The pearl is where you get your testimony. Amen. Because that event, that pain says, this is what God has done. Amen. God has done this. You see, people in the past said, you're on a dead end street. You're on a dead end street. But now they're caught. But you know what? And people that feel like they're coming and they felt like they were in, they were at their wit's end and they were coming to the end of their life. Amen. They came to new life. Amen. Because the old is passing away and the new is arising. I'm telling you the, pro the prophetic word of the Lord. Amen. The, the old is passing away and the new is coming. Why? Through his church. Who has unified every individual being placed in the body severally as he wills. Amen. That your gifting is not for your glory, but for the glory of God. That your gifting is for the benefit of the body. Your gifting is so the world can see the glory of the Lord. Amen. Is that reality? Amen. Courage. Courage is encouraged in this place. Step up and say something for the Lord. Amen. I love that. Amen. You don't have a word for Jesus. Amen. Step out of your intimidations and your fears. Press on to the beachhead. Improvise and overcome when it's been when things have changed and it hasn't gone the way you wanted it to. Amen. You adjust to the battlefield. But the vision stays the same. The mission has to be carried out. Amen. And you have to go on. And there's a few times when it looks as though that we are not doing as well. And we'll see just a moment when uh, what warfares can do and monuments can do 
warfare that it reveals something about us. Monuments are to touch our memory, to not only to recollect, but to reconnect. To reconnect. If you'll show that if just for a moment. a day to remember, to reconnect to a memory of an individual who gave their full measure of devotion. That word, full measure of devotion, was first pinned into the memory of this country just a few miles from here. It's part of the Gettysburg Address. It's down toward the bottom. And very few times individuals ever say that as an emphasis. But it is, they gave their full measure of devotion. Now, Abraham Lincoln said a few things that uh, uh, he thought that what they said that day would probably not be remembered very long. But it has. And his his message only lasted two minutes. 
the, uh, just a few words. But they gave their full measure of devotion. This little video was the, the introduction to uh, Saving Private Ryan. The, uh, uh, my wife has never seen it. She refuses to go watch see it. And uh, truthfully, I don't know if I could watch it again. But that was taking you from the, and by the way, this was probably the representing the private Ryan that was, uh, was found. And they got him because he had brothers that had already been killed. And uh, the word had got out that he was the only one surviving of that family, that, of the sons. And so they were trying to make sure that at least he got home. Those uh, crosses... Every cross was a man. Every cross. My uncle, a guy by the name of Hasco Williams, and I don't know where they got the name Hasco from, but uh, he was my brother, my mother's brother. He died. He made it through the uh, Normandy Beach. They had got up a few days. He was killed on the 26th of June when they were going through the, uh, the hedgerows. Another uncle, because they were filming that day of some of the movements and the maneuvers, happened to, uh, he was, a, my other uncle was a, a medic, and he wasn't, he was an uncle by marriage, but he wasn't, uh, I don't think he was married then. I can't remember now the, the story. But he happened to see the film that showed my uncle getting, other uncle getting killed. The, uh, when the word was given that he had died, it was sent to my grandfather's uh, Herb Williams down in Kentucky and the postman would not take the, 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 because in those days they just, they sent a telegram. And so the postman would not take the telegram to my grandfather's house. Because my grandfather, um, wife was dying. And so he held on to the, uh, to the telegram about a week, letting them bury uh, my grandmother. Sorrow of loss can be devastating, but the knowledge of courage can be inspiring. The idea that a young man freshly married, only two months being married, would leave his bride and go to England for training and to finish training and then make that, that journey onto to the beachhead on the first wave and make it in and actually survive. And then a few days later to give up his life and then his little wife, who only had just a, a, a little while with, it, with her husband. And then the family remembering him because I don't think he was uh, 21 yet when he died. And so that memory would be carried on through our family. I never met him because I was born in 1948 and he was killed in 1944. But I, they would show me pictures of him. They would talk about uh, his life, his values, his love for family. He was the tallest of the Williams. You know, Williams is a Welsh uh, name, and the, uh, the Williams uh, from Wales and Ireland are short people. 
My mother was four foot eleven, and uh, when she was the tallest, and she was uh, four foot eight when she passed away, the uh, so she had shrank some. My grandfather was a little over five foot, maybe five foot two or three, and uh, then I have uh, other uncles who uh, they're about my age and they're all shorter than I am. I took after the East steps on that a little bit. The, uh, but they would share these moments of, uh, of values, of why they had to go and leave the, the uh, Pike County, Kentucky, and go off to war. I remember when I was going in Vietnam, going to, uh, in the Marine Corps, my mother, uh, when I went and told her that I had uh, joined the Marine Corps, and she said, well, you're not old enough. You can't go in. And I said, well, I lied about my age. And she said, well, I'm going to tell them. I said, but, Mom, if you do that, they'll put, they'll put me in jail. I, I was in such rebellion. And uh, so I convinced her that I was going to jail. And I said, and they promised me I won't go to Vietnam. And, uh, yeah, I just lied like crazy. And... Uh, then uh, uh, she sat on the bed and cried, and she says, we lost Hasco. What well, if you don't make it back? I said, Mom, I'm not going to Vietnam. The, uh, and so I went to, went to the Marine Corps at 16. I graduated from boot camp on my 17th birthday the, uh, from Paris Island. That was in October. And then uh, beginning of January, I volunteered for Vietnam. And uh, so I went home, and Mom said, I thought they said that they, you won't have to go. And I said, well, I ended up volunteering. The uh, Asco went because of, of commitments. I went because of foolishness. I just had foolishness in my heart. The, uh, but I started learning something that was important, and that is about commitments and values and uh, uh, reasoning behind things. And these, uh, what we've seen here in this day is Memorial Day, and it's so to mind to, to remember. It's not to remember me as a veteran and all these others that have served so well. It's to remember that there were people that, that ran to the battle line like David because they believed in a cause. Isn't that what David said? Is there not a cause? They ran to the battle line. You and I are here today, and there's a cause for us to be involved in the church. It's the vision of God. It's the working of the Holy Spirit. It's going, it is the bride of Christ. It is, it is the, 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 the essence of imparted glory that we can be part of. The cause of his glory, the knowledge of his glory covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. What can that mean? That means on a dead end street and people running out of time and running out of life and running out of options and there's a light that comes shining up from this dead end street that says this is for the world. And they find not the dead end, but the new beginning. They find a new beginning in Christ. They find how to be related to one another and to fit in and to be used of God and the power of God being manifested. They find that there's vision opening up to them and understanding of values and purpose and design, all of those things taking place. It's a a world for them they never imagined. They've come out of the wounds and the difficulties and the fears and the anxieties and now they're saying you can be of value for 
not only someone, but for God himself, that you were not an accident, that you made it through all that way through, that God, the God of glory has been searching you out. Amen. He has been on you like a hound from heaven. He has been pursuing you in every avenue of life. He has been squeezing your heart and drawing you to the cross that you might know him, that he might deposit it within you. the essence of his being that you might shine him. That you might be the light of him. That you might be the recipient of the prophetic word the first time we hear God say anything. He says, light be. That was before the sun ever shone or the stars ever flickered. <laughs> Amen. That light be, and from that prophetic word, every activity, every word he said had that light in it. It would go into the trees. It would go into the sky. It would go into the stars. It would go into the universe around because it would declare the glory of the Lord. Amen. It would reveal that there's a God, a creator that has brought all of these things about. They may not know what it is. They may not understand how that a creator can do this or who he is. But it will say to them, this can't be just by accident. There was a divine design behind all of this. And then they would be given the honor to search out the matter. Amen. To be a king. Amen. For it's his glory to cover over or to hide it so that we can search it out. My grandfather would come in from the mines of Kentucky. He was a coal miner and a farmer. And he carried a bucket. And it's not uh, like we would think. It had layers. It took uh, the, uh, I can't, it had, it was round and tall and they, they had different, departments in there that they would layers and they would take uh, soup beans or you know whatever they were taking in there to eat and uh, but he would and he didn't like candy the uh, sister Dion he, you wouldn't do well with him uh, just uh, <laughs> the actually he you would do well because he would give you his candy I can tell you that the uh, and uh, us kids because uh, uh, he had, he, his wife died, he married again, and they had more children. And so the second crop was uh, near my age. And so my uncle Roger, who was a pastor, getting ready uh, to make the transition, and he's a couple years older than me in Virginia, in Abington, and uh, uh, he's the oldest. Uh, then there was, I was born, and we live right next door, and uh, that was born, so it's Roger, Ronald, and then Rodney, uh, which is, uh, he's a pastor in, uh, it, he's a pastor in Lebanon, uh, Virginia, and uh, the, so out of that came three, three young boys right after the war that, uh, and, you know, they're my uncles, even though I'm older than Rodney, the, uh, and, uh, but we would all run out there to see him, and, uh, uh, Rodney was a little slower uh, because he had, he had some difficulties with his leg and uh, uh, Roger and I would uh, uh, fight for the, for the, for the, the little uh, uh, can to get the candy out of it. It would be that uh, it would be because there was the, the reward. He didn't like candy but he had something in there that we could search it out you see, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the honor of a king to search it out. Amen. To search out. So we've been called in to search out. But how do we search out? Well, first we come to know something about him. Amen. That he has done this in us. We don't maybe even know who he is yet, but it, that the fact is that we look at this and the... the uh, the, the, the glory of God is uh, there's something about something, a reflected glory that's coming out of all these things. Uh, they, they, the, 
I mean, how can a tree or a universe or stars or any of those things uh, give God any glory? Well, they reflect the glory of God. They reflect what God is doing. Amen. They say something about there's a creator behind all of this. If this isn't just an accident, it causes us to wonder and to think about and to anticipate so we start looking into. And according to Romans, uh, that they will be without excuse. Amen. Because they, they looked at those things. They knew there were a God, but they refused and they went their rebellion. But there's a, there's a reflected glory there that's uh, saying that. But so we search it out and we keep reaching out. Out. And then, as, as uh, Bishop had already pointed out, we, we, we can't, what, how can we give him glory? We, I mean, we, is it just reflective glory? Well, we can't have that because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. But you see, what God had in mind was imparted glory. That he would impart something into our lives. That he would reveal himself in us. What, what did you say? That when this great sa- the great sound of a mighty wind. On that day of Pentecost when God. <laughs> moved in. And deposited within this new birth relationship. Amen. This new beginning. He put the deposit because it's a new creation was taking place. A new creation took place. The old creation was done, being done away with. The new creation is now. So the same thing. Amen. That, that God had done in the beginning with Adam when he breathed into him and he became a living soul. Amen. We, he became. There is a becoming, amen. There is a becoming in God that we become something. And what are we becoming? We're becoming not just a reflection of him. We're becoming one in him. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives within. Amen. That Christ would be within me. That Christ would be within us. That the more that we would get together, amen, my gifting is not the fullness of Christ. It is only a little element. It's like the little lights that they had coming up. It reminded me of the Philippines. We, they always did the uh, cultural dancing with these lights, and, and, uh, and they would come out and uh, just dance around. I always loved that. But I saw that, and there are globes of light. And so my little light is so small. Amen, because my gifting away from the body of Christ, away from everyone, it's so small. Amen, it's, uh, it, but it could be so much more if I could just get it plugged in to where it's supposed to be. Amen, the light gets brighter. Amen, so the body of Christ is coming together. Oh, I tell you, it's a wonderful thing. What is that? Well, that's him. That's him. Because John said that he was the light. And Jesus says, you're the light. Amen. Not another light. Not another light. And you know what it says to me? It says to me that God's will for his church and for us is going to be done openly. Everybody's going to see it. Amen. Everyone's going to see it. When he comes, he's coming in power and great glory. But they're going to see it before the second coming. And they're going to see it in the church. Because the church is coming in to understand who they are and what they're supposed to be doing. It is that understanding that who we are in Christ Not in ourselves, not in our arrogant bragging about ourselves, but it's going to be in the who he is. Amen. That he is seen and revealed and and, and made present in every activity that we have. That it's not enough that we gather together and sing a few songs or something. We must have the presence of God. Amen. We must have this presence. There has to be this manifestation of his glory being manifested through his redeemed. Amen. That they have become vessels where he can live in. He has been deposited. Amen. They have been deposited with God. The Eastern Church has a saying, and I'm almost afraid to say it sometimes because it can bring confusion to some folk. It's called 
theosis. And theosis uh, means that we're becoming God-like. We're not becoming God. He's still the sovereign over all. But if it's no longer I that lives, if I'm not living and Christ is living within and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Faith is reaching out in the vastness of nothing and taking a hold of that which is not and holding on till it becomes that which is. Amen, it's taking a hold and bringing forth and uh, bringing into reality, amen. It's that therefore I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. Amen, the faith that says I will, I'm willing to set aside the splendor of heaven's glory and I'm willing to condescend down into the womb of a virgin and I'm willing to let that virgin bring me forth from her womb and I'm willing to be a, a suck on her breast and have them clean, clean me and then provide for me but I'm the king of glory. I'm not only going to come down to the lowest place and the, the backwoods place or the dead in street. I'm going to go down into the very essence of humanity where a people that were not called a people hardly at all. Amen. In the backwoods of a far off country. In the very essence of a, a, of a cave or a, a stable. I'm going in there where the stink of, a, of, of animals are. I'm going in there where the difficulties of living is. I'm going in there where, they, where there's fear and anxiety and their heads are under, their neck is under the boot of, peop, of a an oppressive people and I'm going in there and I'm going to reveal my glory and I'm going to walk among them and I'm going to see their need and I'm going to be touched by the feelings of their infirmities. I'm going to walk in them and reveal my glory in them. I'm going to go and wherever the Father is saying, I, he, because he said, I can do nothing except the Father tell me. So when he's walking and he's looking around and they're bringing dead people by and they've got a, a widow and they're bearing the son, the Father says, uh, I'm raising that person up. And Jesus goes over and says, live. Amen. Amen. Uh, he goes in for their hungry and he says, well, the Father says, uh, I'm going to feed them today. So he says to them, go out and how we're going to feed them. They said, we don't have enough. He said, well, bring it to, oh, but we got a, a young guy here, a little boy with some fish and loaves. Uh, bring him to me, amen. So he blesses him and uh, he, he lifts it to the Lord and he, he give, praises God and he, he blesses it and then he just keeps reaching into the basket. My God. My God. Blesses, he goes to a wedding and he gives the best wine for last. But they're going, they're going to serve what looked like water. But from the jar comes the wine. I'm telling you about what God does in bringing his church into being. This theme has been talking about the glory. We saw something today about memorials, memory, and reconnecting to remember. We remember names of those who have gone by, but we also reconnect to their values. We have memorials within the church. We need them. One of the things I love about Oasis is that you're reaching out to the vastness and so many different directions, and but you're willing to keep a connection to all that's been passed. You're not trying to wipe it away as if it never existed so we can make a name for ourselves in this time, that you're using them as stepping stones into what's up. Because you, let me tell you something, that legacy is currency. Your legacy is your currency. So you can buy the materials that you need to build the building. So some will only have hay, wood, and stubble. And they will suffer loss. 
but those that use their currency to buy the precious stones, they will, and it won't be a, a, a rancher. It's going to be a skyscraper going into the heavens because we're on one foundation. One foundation. We get that through these values that get infused into our life. Amen. That get displayed as they, as we saw them getting ready to run to the battle line and as this church has run to the battle line over and over again. Now let me say this and I won't keep along because uh, you've got someone else coming and uh, going to cap it all off for us. No nation can ever rise above the values of a citizen's devotion. If we're going to continue to have a great nation, there has to be a communication of values established in our, our communities, and we have to be devoted to them. No nation can rise above the values of its citizens' devotions. It, it, there has to be that devotion there. Values are seeds of character. They are deposits that have to go down into the depths of our soul and our being. It's where seeds germinate. It's in the hidden areas the dark areas, but they are going down because they're going to bring about character. Character is the product of tested insights. Hear me. Character is the product of tested insights. We say we believe something, but if it's not tested, right. amen, it's just a, a, a thought. Uh, a possibility. <laughs> Those are wonderful things to get, but when they become reality within us through test, it has to be put to the test. So what happens? We get confronted with evil and difficulty and wars and rumors of wars and famines and darkness and violence and all those things crashing in around us. And the, the first thing we do, and the enemy wants us to do, is fear. Cower away. Be filled with anxiety. I remember one of the first intense battles that we had in the northern part of Vietnam when I was there. And we had, we had, had a, uh, they flew me in by helicopter and landed us into the mountains of, uh, the, the North Vietnam was right there, and we were at the demilitarized zone, and they dropped us off in the high mountains areas near a place called Mutter's Ridge. And uh, the, uh, it's about three miles south of the DMZ. The, there was plenty of jungle vegetation, but they had a field that was a, a rolling hill, and it was filled with a, uh, elephant grass. And as the helicopters came in and hoovered over, uh, we couldn't make full landing because we were getting some hits, but the, we jumped out. And I remember when I jumped out thinking the ground was closer than it was because the, the elephant grass was blowing in, the, in the, the wind of the helicopters. And I jumped out and I, it seemed like I just went way too far. And when I hit, I, it hurt. And so I rolled around. And then we had to get into position uh, because of, of, of combat. And then we had the others that were coming in by, by uh, landing barge and uh, uh, hitting. And they got ab aboard uh, uh, deuce and a half or trucks and they brought them out there and that's where we first set up the first our fire base there south of the DMZ the but it is and so the first intense battle that we had was that we're getting artillery and uh, mortar rounds from the DMZ and they was just it was it, they they knew where our hill was and they just were hitting us so close. And it was so close. Everything was just exploding. And I was in a mortar section, the 81 millimeter mortar section. And so our job was to get out on the gun. But man, the, it was so intense, we jumped for the hole. <laughs> Amen. We jumped for a hole. And I remember a major coming across there. He was Polish. And uh, uh, 
the, we call him the Mad Pollock. And he, he, he didn't have a shirt on. He had a flak jacket on and no shirt. He had uh, a stogie cigar that was sticking out of his mouth. He had a helmet without the strap on it, and he had a shotgun in his hand. And he come down over there yelling and screaming. I can't tell you what he said fully, but uh, it wasn't, he, he, he was calling us everything but a good milk cow, I can tell you that. And he was telling us to get up out of that ho those holes and get on the gun, amen. And so then our training kicked in and we got on the gun and we were waiting for the fire mission to return fire, amen. But that moment of, uh, there is a moment of fear when everything is crashing in around, but we have to step back. We have to step back and we have to hear the voice. Now, that's a key thing. There is a voice that we need to hear. Amen. A voice that has to give us clear understanding. And so we, we step back and then but, but suddenly our training, what we have been trained in, the values that, that, uh, that uh, bring forth courage. Amen. Because courage is based upon values. Amen. There's something that gets you up and gets you going. That's why a mama stays up all night with a baby. Amen. That's why we rush into the, into the fire when we see a loved one that's in a fire. That's why we go to the battle line. It's because we see the need and there's a value in us. Amen, that's, that's germinating. It's been down inside of us. And it's, it, it's the seed of character. And character is the product of tested insights. But it's anchored in a person's devotion. What keeps us from falling apart? Because it's anchored in devotion. Devotion calls for loyalty faithfulness and fidelity manifested. How are you going to, are you loyal? You see, you never get character strong until you get loyalty anchored. Matter of fact, you can't see character until there's a possibility of betrayal, infidelity, unfaithfulness, it's only when character only comes in. You see, character isn't something we wish for. <laughs> character is like metal being put upon an anvil. And time and circumstances is the hammer that comes down and keeps clanging away at it. But if you get that metal and put it to the fire, there is something happening, Bishop. Amen. The metal becomes the fire. And the fire becomes the metal. And you can't tell what it is. Is it the metal or is it the fire? And in the fire and the metal together, the circumstances that hit that makes sharp metal. A man makes mighty swords, makes instruments of warfare makes instruments of healing, amen, makes all these things that can become beneficial to us, but it has to come through this difficulty, amen. So character isn't a wish into being. We can't just wish for a character, amen, wish that we were a better character. And I, I remember as a young man thinking, I wish I was better at this, amen, but it wasn't in me. I told my wife we got married, we weren't saved, but I got saved about two weeks later. Now she says, she drove me to my knees, but the, the, uh, uh, that wasn't true, amen. The uh, God had been after me a long time. Matter of fact, uh, he had his hook in, his, in my jaw for a while, and his, you know my testimony that, of a young man prophesying to me in, in Vietnam. And, uh, the, uh, but it is, uh, it is this company, you see, I told her, I said, we, we would have never made it unless Jesus came in because I was just such an unfaithful person. I just went by the seat of my britches and everything, just uh, whatever was happening and had none, didn't have enough character to say no to nonsense, just run right into it and do stupid things. So the first thing had to get me into this essence of loyalty, being loyal. I remember one of the first things I did, because I understood it now as I got saved, and I thought, Lord, how can I, how can I get 
stronger than you. And uh, I was stationed in the headquarters of the Marine Corps at the time. And I was, uh, I had different duties. Uh, one duty was a main gate sentry. And one duty was, uh, was uh, involved with the military police. And one duty was uh, security over at the uh, White House and also the main Navy building. And uh, the, depending on the job, what they needed for the time, that's what we, we did. And, but my, my barracks was right over top of the NCO club. And uh, the NCO club is where everyone gets drunk. And so the music going on, the party's going on, and we're directly over top of it. And so we would walk down the stairs, and half the guys in my company uh, worked extra in the NCO club. And we'd go down there, and what was happening, that if I wasn't drunk when I went on duty, I was drunk when I came off duty. Because guys would bring that stuff to us. And uh, so the first thing I needed to do was uh, not go down to the NCO club. And so, but I had a problem. One of my jobs was military police there as we were there. Now, they gave me that job. That wasn't my MOS. My MOS was a grunt and a, a mortarman. The, uh, but uh, they gave us light duty there when we got back from Vietnam. And so what I did, I would, and we always got our hamburgers from down there. They had great fries and hamburgers. You know, Marines live on that stuff in the States. And the, uh, so I would have to, I would say, look, I'll buy if you fly. Go down there and buy it. And so they, I remember one time they went down to buy the burgers and the, and the Cokes and stuff. And uh, one of the guys said, uh, is this Sergeant Eastep's uh, uh, burger? And they said, yeah. He said, well, he liked rum and Coke, didn't he? Yeah, I think he did. And so they bring me up this container that's uh, rum and Coke. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and we're eating the hamburgers, and I ate part of the hamburger, and I'm getting ready to take a drink of the Coke. And every eye of those guys that were in that room turned around and started looking. And I thought, what's this? I looked at that, and I said, what's in this? And one of the guys couldn't handle it anymore. He busted out laughing. He said, they put a little rum and Coke in there for you. It is that you have to, there is, there's a test about your loyalty. Loyalties have to, have to be given. Faithfulness and fidelity have to be, have to be manifested. The quality, uh, the influence that you're going to have, the light that's going to shine has to be from that manifested relationship in the Lord. Has to be there. The last full measure of devotion, I won't be much longer, is, is one's life given up for what? Uh, uh, for what we ascribe to God. I can't give him glory. Matter of fact, let me read this to you. This is out of the uh, Psalms 29. The very first part is a call to worship. Give unto the Lord, this is out of the New King James, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty ones. That word mighty ones is uh, actually el ben, ben or el ben, and you know that El is for God and Ben is for Son. Amen. So the mighty ones could either be angels, it could be sons of God, and it could be rulers or people in authority or power. So it covers all of those areas. But those that are mighty ones is saying to you, okay, you now have come into the influence of God, the heavenly being, or those among us that are mighty in the Lord. And so now what are you going to do? It says, give unto the Lord, you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. But if we can't give him glory because we don't have that, amen, so what are we going to do? Well, if you look at the word, it also means ascribe to the Lord. Amen. Declare the glory of God. Declare the victory of God. Declare, speak forth what God is doing. Amen. You can say whatever the word of God says, you can say, amen. You can claim whatever the word of God has promised you can have. It's yours to have, amen. Ascribe to the Lord, amen. He is exalted. He is lifted up. He is Lord over all. He is victory over all. <laughs> amen. Give the Lord praise. Amen. And then it says, Give to the Lord the glory due His name. Amen. Don't take the glory yourself. Amen. This glory is due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. 
worship. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Worship is what God is looking for. Amen. But not just any kind of worship. Worship in spirit and truth. So united in God that there is this, this essence of light and life coming out of you, worshiping. But it says in, 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 in beauty of holiness. Beauty is the, is, if you look up the word, it talks about the, uh, what's putting on. It's, uh, it's uh, the trappings. It is the, uh, uh, the, the, the coverings. It is the relationship. So if we're covered in God, if we are robed in His righteousness, if we're walking in His grace, amen, we're, 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 we got dressed up in it, amen, and we're, we're doing it for the greater glory. It's, for, it's not just to get by or to give Him uh, anything, amen. I showed up, I sang a song, I gave a testimony. No, I've got to get robed up in Him. I've got to get clothed in Him. I've got to be manifested in Him. His presence must be in my life and over my life and through my life, amen, where he is revealed. It's that power and that is the beauty. And then holiness unto him alone, sanctified, set apart. I'm not the world's, uh, in the world's value anymore and I'm not going the way the world wants. I'm not giving in to the flesh, the world of the devil. Amen, it's to him. My life belongs to him. As I said, that this light that we have, this life that we have in the Lord and light is God. And God is going to defeat the enemies around us openly. It's not going to be in the darkness. As a matter of fact, the darkness is going to help everyone see this. And from that worship comes a... And this acknowledgement of him and this acclaim to him, amen, uh, we hear a voice. It's in worship that we hear God. The, uh, John Stott said, when he, one of his books, he said, I'm never more alive than in public worship. Now, some would say, well, you know, just, what is that just because your gift and our gift together and all of our gifts together is blinging up this magnificent praise and adoration to God. And if that's the case, then my life is hidden God. Amen. My life is in Him. And so the more I'm having, if I can get you and we, I can uh, uh, unify with you and their giftings and all this is in place, suddenly there is the life of God. Amen. Because God put that breath in to replicate Himself. Amen. To give birth unto Him, to, to bring us into the family of God, to make us of the house of God. Amen. The house, like the house of Egypt, has a few things, but the house of God has everything. Amen. That I'm part of the, the lineage of Him. I'm part of the plan, the promise of God. Amen. So therefore, I hear a voice. Now, what is that voice saying? Well, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Amen. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is over all these things. The word, you what can you do? You do it by the word of the Lord. Amen, you, your life is hid in him. Amen, the voice that spoke out and said, light be, amen. And then the, the light came and was housed in human flesh and was the light of the world. And now he's deposited, oh, glory to God, in us. Amen, the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord. That's why you can do what God says you could do. That's why you can be who you are because the great I am says who you are. Amen. It's a song. We sing all of that's the reality of it. Amen. And then it's because it's over the waters. Waters, to me, represent creation, chaos, and detonations. Those are the three major categories of water throughout Scripture. That there is creation... There is chaos, and there's nations. 
the nations are going to come from the waters. Amen. It's, so this, this coming out, the voice of the Lord is powerful over these waters. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty over these waters, over the need of the hour of creativity, inventions, and expounding the gospel and getting it out and the life living and how to live in peace and how to, how to have a, a more healthy society and produce more food and all of those things. He's there. Verse 5, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. And here's really the nations here. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes also... Uh, makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon, Syrian, uh, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. And then, verse 8, the voice of the Lord. Now this is over nations, over creation, nations. And now, how about these howling wildernesses? where the enemy has ruled and reigned. Amen. Where the demons are thick and flourishing. And suddenly we hear something. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice or the word of the Lord, amen, uh, makes the deer uh, give birth or gives new life, amen. The voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord. How did you come? You came by the word of the Lord. How did you, uh, how do you grow in faith, amen? You go in faith by hearing the word of God, amen. It's this word of the Lord that's coming forth. It makes, it, make, it gives birth. It's, it strips the, the forest bare and strips them bare so there can be replenishing. Amen. It uncovers, sets the stage for renewal. Testimonies this week said about the uncovering of our need. Amen. Will some willing to confront us, to let us see where we're at, say we need to make sure that we get renewed. So there's first the uncovering. Amen. We want to cover it over, but if there's an uncovering, suddenly we see that and we cry out unto God. Amen. We reach out for the voice of the Lord, the, 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 the word of the Lord to touch us, minister to us. So it sets renewal. And in his temple, everyone, everyone, amen, says glory. Palace, place, temple was the, what the word means there. And I want to just give you this here, and I'll try to get out of the way. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. He's, he's reigning. He's enabling. He acts. He sits enthroned at the flood. He reigns even in the flood. He sits enthroned the flood. He enables us even in the flood. <clears throat> he acts for us and through us even in the flood. And the Lord sits as king forever. <clears throat> the Lord <clears throat> will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Amen. That's just not the absence of war. That's the tranquility of life. It's when we're at ease with one another. The barriers go down. The wounds. You see, the monuments that we saw, those crosses, to some, every monument was a, was a seed of resentment and anger at the people they fought against. You see, if, we, if we're not careful, we let wounds and our monuments of movements, of uh, church entity, make us bitter at one another. Make us stiff-arm one another. Distance from one another. 
always investigating one another. But those monuments are also places to remember virtue, valor, courage. And it's in this process of peace that these things get moved away. I was talking to Ron Bishop the other night. And uh, I know when you hear his name, you think about me, Bishop Ron, but it's Ron Bishop the other way. The, uh, amen. The, uh, but he was wanting to go, when he first went to South Africa, and he was talking to uh, uh, David Duplessis. And uh, is that right? That he was from South Africa? Was David? And du- Duplessis and Duplessis. I get them mixed up sometimes. Yep, Duplessis. And David... Uh, Brother Duplessis was uh, an instrument in reaching beyond barriers. The, uh, uh, he was able to minister in circles way before the time of uh, reaching, going over these barriers. And they, many places, uh, just would really ridicule him. But Ron asked him, says, uh, Brother Duplessis, how do I, uh, how can I get to the Zulu people and have a, an effective voice among the Zulu people? of South Africa, and he looked at him in his uh, accent of South Africa, and he says, my brother, the first thing you have to do is get rid of the war in your spirit. Get rid of the war in your spirit. And Ron said, I didn't know I had any war. And, but it was to calm and recognize the value of what God was doing, the value of people. You must see them as God sees them. You must see them as whom God is raising up to greatness and glory, the great plan that he has. And we know, and I'm sure uh, Apostle David will tell you, that right now from the African continent, there are more missionaries going out and re-evangelizing much of Europe, America, and Australia, and the world. It is happening. Those that have been discipled now are coming to disciple. Those that have been evangelized are now coming to evangelize. But they are coming with a much deeper and much more consecrated life in God because much of the Western world has gone easy and they have they've leaned back upon their laurels and they haven't called out to God like they should. Amen. They had the head knowledge but not the heart knowledge. And now these individuals are coming and they're saying this is what the word of the Lord says. Amen. It's what they believe in. The, and so they declare the word of the Lord and they say it with such passion with such intensity because they know it. They know the word of the Lord. They hear the word of the Lord. They have a relationship with this great God of glory. And what are they saying? What are they proclaiming? They're not proclaiming defeatism for the church. Oh, glory to God. Amen. They're not claiming, saying that nothing is happening now and you just, you're going down the tubes. And no, they're saying, no, you got to see the glory of God in this. You've got to see a kingdom that is unbeatable. You've got to see a light that shines into the darkness. You got to see the glory of the Lord. Amen. And suddenly tranquility can come into life. And when tranquility comes in, first touches the individual, then the home, then the community, then the area around about, and then a nation. What would it take? What would it take? for revival, renewal, restoration, and the glory of God to cover our land. Amen. It's when we come into peace with God and with one another, and we see the values of the Word of God, and it ignites within us a courage to say, I'm going to do what God's saying. I believe I am what God says I am. I'm going to be able to accomplish what God has been saying for me to do. That doesn't mean I copy everything that someone else is doing because they did it according to the word of the Lord. Amen. We can be inspired by it. And then we can work in to see how God is going to put it on upon us. 
But if we're just running around from one place to another to see what's happening and thinking this is going to be the answer, then uh, we're saying Christ, the anointing is over here, and Christ, the anointing is over here. And we just run all over the place, and all we do is come back with our songs and a, a couple things that they do. <laughs> Amen. But we don't hear the voice of the Lord. Amen. we got to hear the voice of the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord praise and adoration. Amen. Hallelujah.